Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, a... a a nominated designer and a resident shark enjoyer. Thankfully, sharks and not orcas. Nope, nobody wants to deal with orcas. The And the creator of Infinite Revolution in its Overdrive edition. The one and only Gwendolyn Clark. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me. Yep. I had to make the orca joke because, well, orcas are the real villains. Well, I don't know. I think I think there's you know there's room to defend almost any almost any specimen of marine life. I I I love the work they've been doing with all the all the yachts lately. Um, they should, you know they can, they can keep that up. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I've I've had I've made I I remember some I've made the joke about about animals that ha that are ju that have this have similar if not higher levels of. Um, chaotic energy as honey badgers. Right. Orcas are orcas are on the list, though they're especially given the fact that whenever whenever a pot of orcas show up, sharks will get the hell out of dodge. <laughs> yeah. Oh, zebras are also on the list, if if only because if only because they. They pick. They are. They are notorious for picking fights with animals they probably shouldn't, up to and including lions. Then again, their relative. Their relatives are donkeys, so calling them the ass of Africa is accurate. Yeah. But one of the traditions around here is opening with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh yeah, oh man. Um, so I, I want to say my, my like first ever introduction to anything role-playing was... Um, it was it was either Pathfinder Pathfinder One E, or uh, it might have actually been like a a completely homebrew sci-fi system that was like a like a, a friend of a friend uh, wanted playtesters for, mm -hmm. and so I I ended up just uh, being sort of uh, brought along uh, with one of my friends at the time who would just you know kind of. Uh, kind of convinced me, hey, you should you should come do this. You know, this guy's cool. It'll be fun. Um, and I I had like no, no idea of what to expect really. Um, and so I ended up just kind of making, uh, making making my character. And uh, you know, when I realized that, um, you know, the 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 premise of it, uh, of of role playing and you know the getting attached to your character and uh, and the fiction dictating outcomes and things like that. I was like, okay, uh, I can I, I can work with that. Uh, but I I really you know I'm I'm not that that good at these kinds of games yet. I don't want my oh uh, I don't I don't want I don't want to die or I don't want to be a drag on the party. Uh, so I just I had my friend help me uh, go through and and basically build up like this this uh, huge hulking like biggest heaviest armor and biggest heaviest gun because I wanted to make sure that I could you know uh, help people and also uh, and also be protected and then that ended up um, resulting in in my character getting uh, retired uh, a few sessions in just because um because I, I guess you know play play testing uh, and hadn't been checked for balance much but so that was sort of the the ignominious beginning. That might have been like my literal first actual, uh, like tabletop role playing. Mm -hmm. I had been doing like freeform role play on forums and stuff, mm -hmm. and chat rooms and all of that for years and years before that. So that's probably where the itch like actually came from. Uh, is just you know embodying these characters and 
and uh, investing that emotion into this fictional space. And then from there, you know, Pathfinder 1, um, I mostly played games online, uh, just because I didn't have, uh, I didn't have a ton of, you know, uh, local, local friends who were super interested, uh, in tabletop stuff, so it was a lot of, a lot of pick of games, uh, with Roll20, um, which were definitely, definitely a mixed bag, um, especially, you know, when I was, like, still in, still in high school and, you know, trying to, uh, convince convince the people I played with that I wasn't a girl in high school. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that, that was sort of where I, where I kind of, um, you know, where, where it sort of bit me. And I would, I had a, a, a part-time job at the time that was, uh, super slow. I, I was working at an, an ice cream shop. Uh, and there would be, you know, periods where I would open and just people wouldn't, wouldn't come in, uh, for quite a while. And so I'd, I'd set up with my laptop under the guise of, you know, oh, I, I want to do my homework. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was usually, like, the only person, the only person minding the store, because it was, like, a local, small local business. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I wouldn't do homework, I would just make, just make Pathfinder characters. I would write mm -hmm. up, write up backstories and make their sheets and, and, um, you know, flesh them out and just make all these characters and... Uh, almost all of them never really got played, uh, but that was sort of when I realized, oh, this is like, this is something I really, I, I really love. This is something I really, really want to do. Mm -hmm. So, and, oh, go ahead. Oh, I know what I was just say, and like, you know, from there I sort of branched out into a bunch of other systems, and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. Um, when you, when you say, when you say, when you say branching out, um, were a lot were a lot of those kind of kind of um weird one offs or ju or just was it completely all over the place? Uh one offs in the sense of like oh like 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 people's like personal homebrew systems or what home, did you mean by that? Homebrew systems, official stuff, um ex extreme extreme homebrews that became their own things. Right. That sort of thing. Yeah, I so like as far as like one offs or one shots, like I, I mostly played, um, theoretically in like extended campaigns. You know, m most of those didn't end up going very long, just such as the nature of, um, mm -hmm. of doing stuff online. But yeah, I I started with Pathfinder. Uh, from there, I branched out into. I want to say. Here we go, here we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, you know, my friend's random sci-fi homebrew thing. Um, I, I read, uh, Songbirds by, uh, Songbirds First Edition by Snow. I never got to play it, but that definitely kind of, like, set my brain on fire. Uh, I played Magical Burst, um, Pie Finder, as mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cthulhu Tech Tager, uh, which was uh a wild and really fun experience that i still unfortunately have like some fondness for um um well cthulhu well funny you mentioned that since cthulhu tech's coming back yeah i saw they have they they have the uh the second edition i i looked through the quick start it looks it looks promising um because like i the vibe that i'm getting is that or is that the original run was a bit of a kitchen sink so they're planning yeah. on being a bit more focused like one, like one set up for the Shadow War, one for Taggers, one for Max. Yeah, and I I appreciate that, and like especially like they're they're it looks like they're focusing on Taggers first, which makes sense since they were kind of like the the biggest, most iconic thing about the original. And like all I really wanted ever out of the Lutak right was like um I I wanted a new version where they fix the fix the math and like took all the gross shit out and so far that seems like pretty much what they're committed to. Oh. Um, I do remember I do remember doing my doing my own fix um shortly after um Pacific Rim came out. Mm. Um, cuz I was I was on T I was on TG quite a bit and the and of course, when Pacific Rim launched, a lot of people were making the were making the association, um, and I did take an, I did attempt to 
um, in, to integrate the river mechanic that was in Weapons of the Gods with that particular poker dice-like approach that they had. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that the concept that I had was just, was just you roll, you roll, then you then you hold, then you roll again. Um, right. Because the the big problem with that die system was how swingy it was. You would either roll like absolute crap, or you would roll like a god. There there was never really an in an in between because it was either keep one or keep sets or straights. And, right. And if you're um, are you from, are you familiar at all with the rip, with the river system as it was in Weapons of the Gods? Uh, no, I, I have never heard of either of those. Um, Weapons of the Gods is based on a um, manhwa no, no, um, ma, um, graphic novel, um, and eventually it had successors like Legend of the Legends of the Wulin and Lone Wolf Fists. Oh, the, it's it's Jenna Moran. Okay. The idea, the idea, is originally was you're ro you're rolling a set of d10s. Um, the number that matches the tens digit you rolled, the facing is the ones digit. Um, but you can bank unused die in a river and s to and swap them out. That's kind that's kind of what the river mechanic is. It's banking unused die to use in a different roll. So if you got three fives and a not and a nine, you could bank the nine and, and use it later if you've got a couple nines in a future roll. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's fun. Oh, um, because I f I figured, but um, go but going pa going past that going past that, um, I'm not sure I'm not sure how I found it, but somebody did hack Cthulhu Tech into PBTA. Um, oh. I don't rem I don't remember how I found it. It was so it was one of those batches that w that was sent to me by one of my associates. Um, I'm pretty. It it's entirely possible that I may have dug around for it in some sort of fever dream, especially since um, I was I was already digging around for better character sheets because the until I found the um, one that Void State made, which basically became my default. Um. Because much much like World of Darkness, the di you have a situation where the default character sheet is lacking. I think that's the reason Onyx Path just straight up hired Mister Gone because they were because everybody was using his character sheets anyways. Right. But now, when it comes to infinite when it comes to infinite revolution, now I'm fully. I will freely admit that I kind of missed the boat when it came to the original version, so I am playing a little bit of uh, of catch up. Um, I would like to go. I would like to go through some of the entries that were put in the influence map and ki kind of get a feel for what what about those influences you tried to implement within um, within Infinite Revolution. Yeah, absolutely. So, no, I'd love to talk. First one, first one I gotta bring up is Common Rider. Yes. Given my lengthy, given my lengthy history and my deep dive of what what people have been mistakenly calling the Common Rider RPG Convictor Drive. Mm. Yeah, I I wasn't I I uh, looked at that one and I wasn't I wasn't huge on it. I feel like a common rider game, like where you explicitly play as cops, kind of, uh, you know, chafes goes goes against the a lot of the, the ethos of the of the well, original show. I wasn't a huge fan. Well, here here's the problem. It's not exclusively a common rider RPG. That was a misnomer. Mm. It has it has far more it has far more in common with Iron Man. And if I if I had to use a common rider that it that it's drawing upon. The closest one would be Fies. Okay. Uh, but I suppose I suppose I suppose the I suppose one thing I should get into on this is what is what your introduction to Common Rider was because I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that it was one of the 
um, Heisei or Neo Heisei writers? Uh, Rob, so uh, this is this is sort of where I own up and say that uh, my primary inter like introduction and exposure to Common Rider uh, was mostly through my my girlfriend who's super into it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have watched. Um, I'm like going back through and um, trying to remember the names uh, of a lot. Oh, uh, I've I've watched some of Black, which is her favorite. Um, Black and I, would be the t would be the tail end of the sh of the Showa era, like mm -hmm. the year the year about shortly after Black came out. About I'd say midway bet midway when Black came when um. Black RX came out. The transition from the Showa to the Heisei era had been done, um, and that was and that was going to be the last uh, major series until Kuga in two thousand because of one comedian managing to fuck it up for everybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, there was a Japanese comedian who made a gag called "Common No Rider," and it did such damage to comp to oh, Common no. Rider. Um, that it, I'd like I liken it to how a lot of people view the view the view Adam West Batman as treat as treating Batman like a joke. It was that just right. a lot worse, and because of that, you had the Dark Age movies in the '90s that tried to show show that Common Rider is is was not this jokey character. Um, results were mixed. And it wasn't it? It wasn't until um, Kuga all the way in 2000 that it came that it came back. It was only supposed to come back briefly until t until nine, oddly enough 9/11 played an influence when TV Asahi said that it was important to teach youth about justice. Right. Because uh, originally it was just supposed to be Kuga, then Agito, and then that was it. <laughs> but. Mm -hmm. Um. Given that, given that you mentioned black, um, and you put it on the brash end of your um, of your influence map, um, I'm guess I'm guessing. And uh, oh, sorry, I was trying to remember the other the one other that I've had some exposure to, mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of on the opposite. Uh, Forza. Forza. I don't I don't know how you. No, the, um... I, I, everybody I know pronounces it Forze. Okay. Oh. Well, there we go. And and I mean that you know that's the one with the the like, um, the the horoscopes, right? So yeah. there was there was some some influence there for sure. Mm -hmm. Um. But but yeah, those those two and like I again I fully admit my exposure to like Toku stuff in general. Uh, is is a lot more kind of surface level. Um, I I like it, but I'm not. Uh, I wouldn't you know I wouldn't call myself like a a hardcore fan. Uh, but I do think it was a an important uh, aesthetic and like thematic touchstone for IR. It was kind of a good way to sort of bundle up all these you know kind of related tropes into a way that people would be able to immediately immediately identify. Yeah, and everybody's got to start somewhere. Mm hmm. I remember Stan Lee saying every comic is someone's first, and that's a useful thing to go on. But the next one I wanted to ask about it is um, Promare. And actually... Yes. <laughs> the glorious insanity that it, that is Promare. Yeah, no, Promare is uh, something very, very dear to me. I, I love it. Uh so much and it's like um just just it's, it's you know themes of um overwhelming emotion and and like hopeful intensity being something that you know literally physically manifests out around you um the the art style and aesthetic obviously has definitely influenced my own my own tastes and uh the the layout i did for the book and the whole, um, you know, the idea of like humans and and the the kind of inherent brightness 
of the soul uh you know being so so strong and so overwhelming in some people that it that it's literally like you can use it as a power source mm -hmm. uh or whatever is you know you you can kind of draw a pretty direct line from there to uh from there to what i what i ended up going with with the revolvers and the the idea especially of like you know pre pre war uh revolvers uh basically jump starting ships and uh and powering stations and stuff with their turbines uh with sort of the you know the the hopeful kind of more cooperative version of like the the burning or the burnish uh turbine uh that shows up at the end yeah so yeah there's there's a lot of angles uh promare kind of in mm -hmm. the game from yeah um the next one i wanted to ask is is um Gurren Lagann, and I'm guessing it's in that I'm guessing it's in that same ballpark of mm -hmm. um, what inspired you with Promare. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely, it's it's one that you know, it's very much about uh, you know uh, just just emotion and spirit and and hope for humanity overcoming uh, impossible odds and you know relying on relying on not just not just yourself. Um, but also, you know, the, the the people around you and where you came from, mm -hmm. and and just like a running theme through all of these, really, uh, or or at least like a lot of them is is sort of you know, uh, hopeful defiance. Like you know, you're you're never you're never out until you're all the way out. Yeah. Um. And just also like the sort of the you know crazy over the top scale mm -hmm. at the end, uh, kind of was reflected in you know the the uh intense speeds and and solar system uh level stakes that uh that the game has yeah i can i can certainly get be i can certainly get behind that mm -hmm. um the following up following on from that from that same group of um from that same mm -hmm. group of people there's the one two punch of gunbuster and diebuster yeah so uh those are probably like th those two because i i can't really consider them uh consider them separately from each other i think those are the most important entries on the map uh gunbuster like flat out if i had to pick a single a single piece of media that's like yeah this this is this is ir it's it's gunbuster mm -hmm. um everything from the the space monsters and you know their their relationship to both humanity and to the solar system to um uh extreme speeds and time dilation uh being you know a a an actually plot relevant thing uh and and creating stakes there um just the the sort of uh the kind of short-lived and and bombastic and you know very fireworky nature of the topless and how uh, in, in die buster and you know how how they're sort of destined to live these uh these shorter but you know very meaningful and very intense lives mm -hmm. um the aesthetic uh like yeah there's there's a, a ton of stuff and like it was it was also one of the first you know uh the the first pieces of anime that i'd watched that like really really like super resonated with me uh and and it's, i've kind of carried around carried it around with me uh ever since which is and i think it's funny that that is probably like the core influence because uh something i've sort of fought against uh with varying uh varying degrees of success is you know the perception of this game as like a mecha game when it's you know, it, it's closer to something like a like like a like a Toku show, uh, as far as like it's you know you have your your human scale like uh, suit with these cool powers that get projected out around you, as opposed to like a robot you're piloting. But like uh, that aside, like basically every other facet of Gunbuster Diebuster is kind of like spot on, and I think it has its its DNA runs through like almost every every facet of the game yeah well it is it's funny it's funny you mentioned that particular mecha and, and exosuit relationship since mm -hmm. um 
The one in the early design documents for the original Mobile Suit Gundam, there was a leaning more towards them being designed like power armor rather than um, the assumptions of Mecha at that time. Um, mm -hmm. Like I know, I know a lot of people bring up Gundam as this differentiate between super robot and real robot, but the line's not as much there as as people think, especially since it keep you it keeps using a lot of camera techniques that were pioneered with the super robot genre, up to and including what's known as brave perspective or the Obari pose. Right. And even if you have never even if you've never seen the Obari even if you've never heard of the Obari pose, I guarantee you've seen it. Definitely. Oh. Uh, and just just for just just Oh, for the me. big yeah, the big sword. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just yeah. looked it up. Yeah. Like the, some somebody did a collage of just a bunch of different anime that sh that use it. Um that part that particular camera shot and the Itano Circus are um, are ones where everybody's seen it in one form, even if they don't know what it's called. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the interesting ones that I found because of how at, because of the absolute dedication to crazy <laughs> yeah. on the influence map is Redline, and more people need to talk about Redline. Oh, I love I love Redline. Oh. Um, if I ever got a chance to meet the director, I would ask him if he was inspired by the Cannonball Run. Because, <clears throat> well, are you familiar at all with that? With the uh, no, no, I've never heard of that. The Cannonball Run is an it was an infamous um, illegal street race across um, across continental um, U.S. Um, <clears throat> the idea what the idea was you get you go from I, bl I believe it was New York. All, all the way to California in whatever vehicle you can in the shortest amount of time. Oh wow. Uh, it it was something it was made it was made infamous in I want to want to say the want to say the the mid to late 60s. It was done a few times it is technically illegal. <laughs> not that that's not that that stopped a whole crew making a movie Naturally. about it. Um uh, there w there was a attempt to recreate it across Canada a few years ago, which was an interesting beast. Uh, and when I say any vehicle, I I mean that this is the kind of race where you could have a van and, and a sports car in the same race, and no one would bat an eye. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and given the sheer variety of vehicles in Redline, um, that that was something that always came to mind. Yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Oh. And, because I, I know a lot of people will, will say will say anime wacky races, but I feel that that's too easy. Like it's, Oh, it's, as far as, like, the like the through line between uh, this and IR? Yeah. Yeah. No, so, so Redline, uh, I mean, yeah, like, the, the, you know, extreme speed... Uh, and like very very anime aesthetic is definitely part of it. Uh, I think the big thing is just like the the commitment to like raw maximalism and and like joy in in the medium and in what's being portrayed uh, and and just everything else. I think is you know something that uh, something that I felt was was pretty appropriate for the attitude I took towards IR. You know, I, I love this game. I want to do everything with it I could uh, that, you know, would make the game better and still be workable. And it is very, very much uh, a labor of love, uh, yeah. just just like Redline was. And the vibe I get between that is kind, is kind of a ref When you mentioned maximalism... Um, I can see why Redline would be some would be something brought up because the pe the people who are that the people who are that level of gearhead or that or that level of um of of um pilots mm -hmm. they don't think like uh, like other people what what the kind of the kind of risks that that are taken that would be considered crazy by anybody else is not is not seen as such by by them. 
Yeah, um, absolutely, exactly. I don't think it's a coincidence that you can you can kind of put a you can kind of put a um kind of a Venn diagram between a lot of the aesthetics of mech pilots and a lot of the aesthetics of of um say, of say fi say fighter pilots in ver in various militaries or e or even um yes. pe even um gearheads or spe especially people who were involved in that bo that boom of import tuner culture in the er in the early 2000s mm -hmm. oh my god yeah that was that was actually something that i meant to mention as well is both redline and the whole and uh gunbuster diebuster mm -hmm. uh gunbuster in particular you know uh being like literally just a uh you know a fighter pilot drama like being just top gun with robots like mm -hmm. the whole ace pilot ace pilot cultural touchstone and just the the stories that come out of that and like you said, you know, there's there's a pretty clear mapping of that onto, um, onto uh, like race drivers and fantasy and stuff like that. Those were also very much like core influences for how I wanted to, how I wanted to portray uh, the the revolvers. And I'd I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the insanity of Rally Group B from the from the eighties. Mm -hmm. Um, that was a in the in the mid eighties. The FIA, who's the governing body of both Formula One and World Rally Championship, decided to make a subdivision of rally that had lowered um, restrictions. Because for any manufacturer to have their car in one of those races, there's a lot of restrictions that you have to go by when it comes to and when it comes to body shape, when it comes to engine size, when it comes to weight. And if you're even slightly off on the weight, you will get penalized quite a bit. Um, one of the big ones was you, a manufacturer had to sell a certain amount of cars each year in order to qualify. With Group B, they lowered a lot of those restrictions to try and get more manufacturers in. But the result was you'd have these car, you'd have these um, ridiculously powerful engines that were both supercharged and turbocharged. Yes, you can do both <laughs> on vehicles that were half the weight. On uh, uh, and this is on off-road tracks because it's rally. So I, th I think you can. It doesn't. Oh it, yeah, that's yeah. It doesn't take a genius to see what to see what's going to happen from that. Definitely. But um, I also, but I'm guessing that sort of maximalism is part is part of the reason why. Um, something like Bayonet is is also in this list because of how mm -hmm. um, over, over the top it go it goes. Yeah, yeah, Bayonetta is there for you know just the this year like flash and style, mm -hmm. um, and you know the fact that it's like you know very very fun and very and very out there, but also at its core like a you know a, a character driven story, mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, you know a lot of it's direct influences from like uh like magical girl media uh definitely also show up yeah um now when it i know that you had mentioned De um destiny on the influence map and mm -hmm. i'm guessing that i'm guessing that a, a part of that has to do with the with this mix of magic like effects and technology and also the suits yeah definitely which I can definitely see that, and um, af having ha having had some time to pl to play it, I'd recommend looking into the Last Descendants because it is okay. it is it is stepping into the into that same area, and in a lot of ways, I actually prefer it over Destiny. Um, at least from what I played out of the out of the beta, I did I did sign up for that. I've messed around with it a bit, and yeah, it's lean it's leaning into that. Um, Awesome. I mean, yeah. I probably I probably would have I probably would have brought up Anthem, but we know how the Anthem story turned out. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but now with with that in mind, uh, I know that you said on the Kickstarter that core resolution is a D6 pool, but are are we talking a success based of a success based affair, a sum based affair, what sort of d6 pool is the core resolution working with yeah so it's um 
it's it's blades uh if you're if you're familiar not not literally uh but the the way you build the dice pool is is so you you have you know a rating uh in whatever you're rolling you roll uh, xd6 and then a six is a success four to five is a uh, success at a cost one to three is a miss and two sixes is a crit mm-hmm. um so nice nice and straightforward yeah <clears throat> Now, with with that in with that in mind, uh, given that given, I do have to address a bit of an elephant in the room regarding the idea of dogfighting, because mm-hmm. that's something that a lot of people have have certainly uh, have certainly attempted, and one of the things that makes dogfighting tricky, and I'm curious how you how you guys have ha- have ha- how you have handled it is. How do you how do you make sure that dogfighting doesn't devolve into a a um duet between two participants? Essentially, the hacker problem that um, cyberpunk games can have. Uh, I'm not I'm not quite sure I follow. Just like the idea of like you know you being on one person's tail and then or or just the idea of dogfighting as like a usually a one v one. It's uh-huh. more. It's more of the yeah. latter. the The reason I okay. liken it to the hacker issue, because in a lot of cyberpunk games, you, you even if mm-hmm. multiple people could do hacking, because of how people operate, you're going to have one person who's designated as the hacker. Right. And with how a lot of hacking systems work, it's very easy for the hacking sequence to be this extended duet between them and the GM. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. That that makes total sense. Actually. Will you excuse me for just like uh, 20 seconds? I'm going to go and refill my water. Uh, But then I will be happy to answer once I'm back. All right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, So, uh, yeah, the the way that I, I I guess, address that uh, was sort of from from the ground up, I uh, had wanted this to be a game about, you know, um, overwhelming odds and these, like, big, big bombastic fights Mm -hmm. um which usually means you're gonna be you know you're gonna be uh burning through a whole bunch of enemies uh in any one given combat if you're familiar with um lumen at all that was sort of the yeah that that was the base srd that uh the original game like original version of the game was was based on Mm -hmm. uh and lumen is all about you know you have uh boatloads of enemies uh and and very high powered player characters and uh you know, more about finding creative and effective ways to uh, to push through them uh, as opposed to any um, any like single protracted battle. So mm-hmm. that's that's sort of I think how the game addresses it is you know you have um, large large swaths of these enemies uh, that um, kind of demand the whole group's participation uh to you know to actually clear them out and uh there are like there are boss you know boss rank enemies as well that are designed for that more that more singular focused experience but um that's uh even then you know there i put a lot of effort into making sure they were uh dynamic and could uh, sort of move around and affect affect the whole the whole group uh, and not just be locked into sort of a a one a one on one duel. Mm-hmm. Now, with with that in mi- with that in mind, the within the within the um, drive cores that you have, which you've built which you've built around the zodiac, are th- since you meant since you invoked blades in the dark earlier are. Mm-hmm. Drive cores akin to playbooks, or is it not? Ex- is it not exactly a one to one on that front? Yeah, I would not call it a one to one. Um, mostly because, uh, like, a-, a playbook sort of, I think, kind of in- informs, uh, usually like a more holistic view of your character. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Blades, you know, if you're if you're like a, um, a lurk, um. Or a, uh, you know, I actually haven't played much played, so I can't think of uh, another one of them off the top of my head. But you know, uh, I've, I'm 
very familiar with blue books in mm -hmm. in other rule sets and uh, a lot of them are focused around kind of defining a um defining a specific like thematic archetype that your or or like like character archetype that your character slots into uh and the draft cores definitely have they have shades of that uh there are there are you know themes running through them that are uh usually attached to their their zodiac uh astrological origins uh but it's it's not quite so much like oh you know you pick you pick an Aries core okay you're this kind of person right i wanted to leave uh, really ample room for um for just more more player and character expression mm -hmm. uh within that while still you know uh still giving these these very cool thematic options for people to to uh like go with and i think that's that's been really fun to watch people uh pick drive cores that maybe resonate with them like as a as a person as a player and then go and make this character who like maybe like maybe they didn't they you know didn't want this this core they don't feel like it it suits them they didn't ask for these these kinds of powers and that that friction and um you know poten potential for for mismatch and and complication and and complexity i think is uh well, one of the things i'm i'm proud of and one of the one of the things that's really cool to see mm -hmm. now with that with that in with that in mind i'd i'd kind of like to get a feel for some, for some of the particular kits when it comes to the drive cores mm -hmm. now obviously going through all 12 in one go would be a bit much so let me pander to myself at for for this and ask and ask about the equivalent of Leo given the zodiac basis. So what 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 would the Leo kit kind of build around? Yeah, yeah. So the Leo is all about. I mean, um, it was one of the one of the earlier ones I designed, um, and one that I I think I uh, had a lot of fondness for uh, and and personal bias, but um, the Leo is all about. Uh, making you know, making themselves sort of the the center of the fight and thriving off, uh, thriving off involving themselves in as much of it as possible. So their uh, their uh, passive ability uh, makes all their weapons apply radiance, which is a uh, like a uh, ticking over time buff that burn or debuff that burns enemies. It hits. It lasts forever. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then enemy when enemies uh, die with it, they explode and spread radiance to nearby nearby enemies. So, uh, and then all their all their powers are focused on uh, the more radiance uh, they they have. So the more the more enemies that they've you know lit lit up and lit on fire, uh, the more powerful they get. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of their a lot of their abilities have like. Uh, scaling with with the radiance, uh, so uh, they can they get you know stronger and more mobile and just much much scarier and more dramatic. Uh, the more the more they've you know spread this this fire around, uh, and they also their their powers also get uh, substantially riskier uh, because they the drive stress that they generate goes up with uh with each foe that has radiance so there's there's very much this you know i i need to burn the brightest i need to be i need to be the center of everything i need to be uh em eminent mm. um you know whether whether or not it it makes me uh makes me burn up and that's that's reflected in their you know their burn scars their consequences as well they're all about um things that make you very conspicuous things that uh that sort of encourage you to risk risk yourself even more uh to you know get uh accomplish your ambitions and um and yeah so they're they're very kind of um very uh what's the word um bombastic i guess but mm -hmm. but you know and and also very very um snowbally there we go uh you know they they want to kind of dominate dominate the battle early and then just uh 
take it into this big, big dramatic finale. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm guessing building to a crescendo is something that's a, a um, common feature regardless of drive core. It's more a matter of how they get to, for lack mm-hmm. of a better term, Rome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, more or less. Like, there are definitely some of them that have, I think, more, you know, more general purpose toolkits or like like have um have a lot of uh a lot of varied options but broadly the the sort of general template that i i put out right is like they the passive ability uh sort of sets up something that you something cool that you can do and then the powers are all about you know here here's the payoff here's what you here's what you do now, when when it comes to when it comes to powers, do you treat them as a, as a kind of move, or is it or is it a case where um, utilizing these powers uses some uses some sort of resource, or is it a little column A and a little column B? Uh, no, yeah. So the powers definitely use a resource, uh, and they're I, I wouldn't I wouldn't really call them much like moves uh, because uh, the the big thing is is moves in PBTA and uh, you know. Uh, its descendants at all uh, moves are something you roll for. Uh, you never roll for powers uh, in in IR. They just they just happen. That's the the lumen influence showing again. Where like you know you, you roll to make attacks uh, and to like you know try try non standard things and improvise. But if you're using like one of your cool abilities, it it, it there's no chance for it to fail. It just it just happens. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Uh, there is there is a cost for basically every power, uh, in that every power generates drive stress, which is a um, a uh, ascending gauge that when it fills up, uh, gives you a permanent uh, narrative consequence, and also uh, ticks you one closer to uh, permanent you know permanent character death basically. Mm-hmm. And given given that, I could see I could see the possibility of of some players playing a bit defensive. So how how do you how would you given that given how you have it work, um, how would you curb the rainy day paradox, as it were? Yeah, yeah. Um. So there's there's a couple answers, to that. uh, and and I think some of them are. Some of them are more relevant to like the stuff that I'm going to be introducing with like the the newer Kickstarter version of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the sort of the initial one um, <clears throat> that I that I have tried to carry through every version is just uh, just make the powers really cool. Uh, make it so that players really want to use them, so that they you know they don't want to uh, just just hide and pull back uh and then another another thing that i think is still going to be similarly similarly present across all the versions is uh like by and large using powers is less risky uh in the short term than than like uh attacking with your weapons which is like the main other action you take you know that's the main other uh, offensive action you take in combat, mm-hmm. uh, because the way the way Lumen works uh, and sort of the way that I inherited enemies working uh, for this game is that uh, if you roll a if you don't roll a full success, right? So like if you roll a five or below, whenever uh, as your highest die, whenever you roll in combat, uh, then an, an enemy gets to take a turn. Um, so enemies don't have like don't necessarily have like standard initiative. Instead you sort of can activate them in response to, you know, uh, as as a uh, complication, basically, mm-hmm. for the players. Uh, so, you know, yeah, you if you want to just not use your powers and play really, play really defensive with your drive stress, you can do that, but that means you'll be rolling to attack a lot more, which means, you know, you risk enemies activated more often. Um, and so there's, there's sort of a, a, almost an equal assessment there. Uh, and there's also the fact that... Uh, Drive stress is very predictable mm-hmm. in how it's generated. Every power generates the same flat amount every single time, and you know exactly what your burn, like your drive core's capacity for taking it is before you risk like permanent consequences. Mm-hmm. So it's it's uh, something you can you can manage 
uh, as opposed to, you know, something that you just, you're sort of pushing further and further into additional risk every time. Yeah. Now, obvious, obvious, with the three modes of play, would it be fair of me to say mm -hmm. that it's, that it's built kind of around the idea of a, of a three act affair, the, the way, say, the way, say a television episode might work? Um, I think that's definitely like a way you could structure a mission, but I don't, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's necessarily, you know, explicitly that, uh, because, uh, obviously downtime is the one where, you know, it, it kind of only really makes sense for it to like bookend a mission. Like you either have it at the start or the end or both. Um, but, uh, between combat and ops, uh, I, I sort of designed both of those to be pretty flexible in how in how they work uh, and uh, like to sometimes occur you know multiple times within the same mission um so yeah so like I, I think you know uh, uh, ops then a combat and then downtime is like a perfectly perfectly reasonable like very short maybe one shot or or a uh, small mission mm -hmm. uh, for IR, but that's that's not necessarily the the assumption I had uh, going in when I when I made it. I wanted I wanted some more flexibility there. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, I w obviously I was not there for the original version, um, mm -hmm. pro probably because I was wa I was either wandering in the wilderness or laughing at people who can't who um lit who live in my state but somehow still can't handle the winter <laughs> right uh, but what were between what would you say were some of the big um learning experiences from the original infinite revolution that you're tr that you're um taking into account for this overdrive edition of it oh yeah no i i have i have quite a few of those um so and and uh, one thing that I think is important to mention about the original version that has sort of informed informed a lot of its design and I think is uh, something that I'm, you know, working with and around and past the legacy of even now, is that uh, the original game was made in about 40 days, start, start to finish, like concept to layout to uh, rules to finish PDF was in about a month uh, because it was for a game jam. Uh, and I wanted to get it in under the deadline. Um, so there's a lot of aspects of it that I, you know, have since been kind of expanding on or fleshing out uh, things that I maybe did more out of out of convenience uh, or like, you know, oh, this this is good enough. I need to write, you know, uh, these six other pages so this this will work for now and I can come back to it. Um. So I think that 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 was definitely some of it is is being able to take more time. Um, I think as far as like you know more more specific lessons, uh, I think leaning into uh, you know player flexibility and flexibility of of approach for uh, especially like for ops scenes. Uh, the old the old version of ops rules were kind of. Uh, I I would say the the least the least fleshed out like aspect of the entire book. They were sort of um, you know one of the one of the cuts for time uh, in that regard. Uh, and so a lot of my work on Overdrive has been revisiting those and making them into something more more uh, like you know thought provoking and and structured and coherent and uh, just conducive maybe to you know um both making sense and not being overly overly restrictive or or punishing um so uh that's that's been uh, a big thing is just you know go, going back and uh realizing you know how much of this was like how much of these were uh designs that I did because I thought they were great and how much how much of it was because um uh because I you know need to make the deadline. Uh and then aside from that, uh I've also uh kind of a, a re like repeating point of feedback uh that I've gotten that I've tried to take to heart and you know 
uh, build into this this new version of the book is that uh, people really want, uh, really, really appreciate and benefit from, like, uh, grounding uh, and and you know, in and uh, like source uh, inspiration mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to a setting that's kind of as as unique and has as you know uh, a very specific fictional theater it operates in as irs um you know it's 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 easy i would say if you're a relatively experienced dm uh you know if, if you get like a like a fantasy system right um like your your swords and sorcery uh you know you you generally know what a what a quest in a in a in a swords and sorcery thing is gonna look like right like you you can come up with you know five of those off the dome and like and yeah sure you know you might have to flesh them out a little bit more but like the the wellspring the cultural touchstones are that that's all there already mm -hmm. uh i heard doesn't really have because it's very much kind of doing its own thing uh and you know space is big and a lot more empty than your average you know average continent or planet uh so i've really tried to focus on giving uh giving people like you know seeds for ideas for sessions and campaigns uh the full book is going to have a a full uh start to finish like introductory adventure mm -hmm. uh to give him just just an idea of this is this is what the game's game looks like this is you know the kind of stuff that you'll be doing uh these are the stakes this is the the idea uh and and so far uh people have responded very positively to every every uh kind of you know, motion in that direction that made. So that's definitely something I'm gonna I'm gonna keep up with. Yeah. And I'm, in this, in the spirit of of that, do you have plans on putting in some some sort of story seed ge generator um, for GMs to kind of push things along? Uh, yeah, definitely. So um, I'm probably gonna include like at least you know some like some uh smaller like smaller complications and and like mission seeds uh in the core book and then in addition to that um one of the stretch goals that we did end up hitting is uh is uh infinite revolution ignition which is a uh standalone that's going to be basically all about like like you said the story seeds and like generative side of things so it's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of like example mission sit reps and uh, tables for making your own stations and your own, you know, um, your own like thematic complications. Uh, just just all about sparking those those GM ideas and and player ideas and um, yeah, and and giving giving people you know throwing my ideas out there into the into the void uh, to sort of give a. A look at you know the kind of things I see when I think about this game, uh, and then letting people's imaginations run wild uh, using those. Mm -hmm. Now, with all with all of that said, we're the, in the development of, bo of both the original and the, and this newer version. Um, were there any cases wh where there was an idea that you? Th that you thought would work, but as things developed, it kind of evolved out, evolved out of being um, apropos. Oh, definitely, yeah. No, like um, the the biggest one that I can think of that's most directly relevant to you know this this iteration of the game is at the very start of making the uh, making the first version for for Lumen. Uh, I had the idea of okay, what if what if you have this this one number that's like your character's like power rating right like your your drive rpm mm -hmm. and what if you know you roll dice based on that number and then that like not not like one to one but like uh and you know doing doing certain certain powers and abilities made that number climb um and then you know leveling up would make it climb way more and like certain certain things would make it uh would would key off of that or or be be directly affected by by that rpm so just just kind of uh running with the idea of you know infinitely ascending energy uh having this 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 rpm rating of how fast your turbine is spinning being like um 
you know, be, being a, a very real component of play and having something uh, that, you know, that, that grows with you and ascends and, like, that you have to manage. Uh, and, and that fell apart really fast, uh, just because, one, you know, doing, like, addition to a five-digit number is just not something most people want to bother with. And even if I if I drastically simplified it, it just ended up being like having having scaling work between you know using individual powers and and increasing the stakes there and like you know leveling up where you would theoretically add like a whole order of magnitude to this um, just didn't it it didn't really make make sense. Um, so uh, RPM is still in the game. But it's basically just a cosmetic feature. Uh, you you still you pick a five digit number to represent how fast your revolver's turbine is spinning at the start of the game, and then every time you complete a mission, so like every time you advance uh, by by a rank such as it is, uh, you add another another digit, yep. uh, and that can be any number you want. Uh, it's there's no mechanical significance to it other than. Um, other than, you know, the bigger it is, that signifies you've, you've completed more missions. Uh, in the old version, a couple abilities did scale off of RPM, but mostly as a, like, mo mostly as a, like, you know, an entertaining uh, overkill. Uh, because, because you know, it's, it's like, the, the most things in this game deal, like, single-digit numbers, right? So if I say deals harm equal to your RPM, that's essentially the same as saying this, you know, this destroys anything in one hit. It's just more fun to think of, you know, oh, I'm doing, I'm doing, you know, uh, 77,000 damage uh, in, in a single shot. Mm -hmm. uh, and those were always for, you know, the big, like, the, the big over-the-top death moves. Um, mm -hmm. But, but yeah, so, so R RPM was kind of the, one of the big seeds of the original game that ended up being more more vestigial uh, and and more just kind of flavor flavor oriented than than anything else. Yeah. Now, with that in mind, what would you be sh what would you be shooting for as far as a total page count for th for this edition? Yeah. So that's you know uh, going to be in flux to an extent, just just because of um, uh, the rules overhauls and um, you know. Doing doing an updated layout and stuff, uh, but I I want to say my my tentative like my projection is between like seventy and a hundred pages. Uh, that might vary. I'm I'm hoping to have a hundred as like my top end, just because um, I think beyond that would get unwieldy. And also that's uh, honestly that's what I priced. Uh, like I I priced the the books and you know Kickstarter. Uh, things for with the consideration of printing like a, a hundred page book in mind uh, and like the the current PDF uh, is is about 50 pages um give or take I guess it's it's 65 and then 50 of you know actual actual game content uh so I'm I'm you know planning for some some substantial expansion there uh but I, I guess like 80 85 as like a, a happy medium there mm-hmm I can I can definitely see that. And what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but a general ballpark. Yeah, so um uh right now, uh Q3 of 2024 is where I'm going to be doing uh Kickstarter fulfillment and you know that that will be uh when everybody hopefully gets their books and their PDFs and then uh, I'll be doing a uh, a release of the PDF uh, on itch as well uh, in that time frame uh, probably after you know after I've made sure that everyone uh, everyone gets their PDFs and maybe have ha have some time to do some uh, like like errata or revisions if if um, those are necessary ideally they won't be uh, but yeah so so summer of 2024 is where I'm aiming and then uh, at some point after that, as well, uh, I'll have, you know, back stock and additional books um, available from third-party distributors uh, if uh, if people want to, you know, pick up their own physical copy that way. Mm -hmm. And I will certainly be looking forward to, to seeing it. Oh, 
but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Yeah, of course. Thank, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! Alright, thank you so much. Bye.